Really, don't don't get out of your chair. No, no. I got this covered. I can handle this. <gasps> I insist on totally under control. I know I owe you a follow-up to the gears video. I promise that'll be next. After all, I still want to build that thing. But frankly, it's been way too cold to be actually using my brain. I mean, I'm having trouble functioning down here. Not like it's too cold, I'm not in the mood. I'm having trouble functioning like biologically. I do have a space heater in here. In fact, I'm literally sitting on it, but I'm not quite sure who's keeping who warm. Craziest thing happened after that gear video. I must have accidentally left my 3D copier on my wallet. It's been duplicating the cash I had in there every hour for the past week. Anyway, long story, I ended up with an extra $4 I didn't know I had. Between that and both the kids' piggy banks, I went out and did some shopping. This might not be super exciting. If you wanted to skip this video, I wouldn't be upset. But I've got to get this stuff cleaned up and off the floor before I trip over it for the 15th time and break something important. What I'm really excited about is this universal vice. I've always wanted one of these things. This over here is a bench shear. If it still works, it should be a handy addition. But let's tear into these one at a time. A bench shear is nothing more than a fun-sized version of one of these. It's a giant pair of scissors for cutting metal. And it's meant to be bolted down to a bench, kind of like this one. Don't you just love it when a plan comes together? Now, if I personally were to lay out my hard-copied cache for a bench shear, it probably wouldn't be this style. I'd love a throatless shear, or maybe a rotary, for cutting curves. You know, in fact, a rotary shear might make for a great project. But I got this thing for next to nothing, so here it is. And it doesn't appear to have much, really, if any, use on it at all. I'm going to break it down just to give it a good cleaning and a once-over. It is missing its hold down, the foot that keeps material from rolling up parallel to the blades. The foot is meant to keep this kind of thing from happening, the material picking up and getting in between the blades. I'm sure we've probably all had that happen before with dull scissors. The stroke marks you see here, kind of the swiped off clean area, I did that. I tried it when I got home, but it took like a two-foot cheater ball on a three-foot cheater bar just to break the thing loose. This thing's either never been used or it hasn't been used in a very, very long time. Okay, give me just a minute to take this thing apart. And there it is. I was all amped up for a fight, but this thing came apart pretty easy. Now I feel kind of silly having wasted five minutes yelling to myself in the mirror and slapping myself in the face. This thing has no maker's mark on it. No tags, no country of origin. And I was pretty sure it was a classic low-cost cheer you see everywhere these days. But but the more I tripped over this thing, the more futile attempts I made at picking it up and throwing it across the room in a fit of rage, the more I started to notice about it. First thing is the frame isn't welded. It's a single piece that has a pressed and machined offset. That's not cheap to do. Typically, the ones that you see these days, I think anyway, are either bolted plates or welded to give it its offset. Second, since this thing is missing its foot and I'm gonna have to build one, I went to find a bolt to fit that threaded hole, and so far I haven't been able to identify that thread. It's somewhere in the half inch, 12 millimeter range. I mean, that's approximately the nominal size, but neither of those standard fasteners work. Threads don't appear to be damaged, and I can't really get a good read with my thread gauge. If I use that hole, I'm gonna have to drill it out and tap it to a standard size. All right, so this thing has never been used. Or if it has been used, it's been used properly. And come on now, really, what are the odds?
That was 40 inches of weld, a little bit less. I didn't do a continuous on the inside. At about normal speed, normal pace, a little bit of cleaning, pick up some more filler rod, continue welding, reposition, etc. And I've been keeping track. The water cooler started at 15 degrees. And when I just turned it off, this thing is still smoking hot. The temperature controller is showing 22 degrees. That was 220 amps the entire time I just floored it. This is three quarter inch plate. Now the, the cup is pretty toasty. The torch on the other hand, well, it's 22 degrees. <laughs> You know, one of the things I always wish I'd learned how to do is how to just let paint dry. Now this movable blade used to just run up against the frame, up against that paint. It hinges on a shoulder bolt, but the shoulder on the bolt doesn't make it through the other side. If I tighten this too much, I'm driving the blade up against the painted frame. I'm not sure if this is gonna work, but I'm just gonna throw in a very thin shim, like a very thin washer. That would keep it off the frame, but I don't know if I have the clearance between the blades to actually do that. And while it's cutting, the top blade now has space back here to sort of deflect out of the way, which is probably also bad. All the fasteners go into tapped holes, and then there's a jam nut in the back. That's how you set the tolerance or the gaps between these parts. If this weren't here, and you just tighten the shoulder bolt down, well, you wouldn't be able to move the lever. If I back that off a smidge, I can lock that joint in position, again, leaving some amount of gap between the moving parts. And this, this is gonna be tedious. You know, I'm really liking this color. This is called, hold on, let me grab the can. What I should have made the weld cart gray. That's nice, I'll have to remember that for next time. So I had to take that shim out. That thing was only seven, maybe eight thou. But as I've been snugging up all of the fasteners, the blades started to eat themselves. That's quite a tight fit for a pressed piece of plate. Now this is 38 gauge typing paper, not to be confused with printer paper. So the shear appears to be sharp. No dull spots along the length. I don't see any tearing or ripping. I don't know how good of a test this is, but we'll try it in a minute with some sheet metal. Now what you saw me add earlier, this reinforcement across the top and back, I don't think was probably strictly necessary. Heck, I don't even know if it was a good idea. The intention there was to give a little bit more torsional rigidity to the frame. Like it's pretty darn beefy as it is, but if you push the capacity or you tend to cut more towards the front than the back, the forces are really, really high. So the tendency for the blades to sort of separate is still there. Of course, that's not a problem if you stay within the capacity of the bench shear, or it shouldn't be a problem, but I know me. Sooner or later, I'm gonna put something in here I wish I didn't. And here's hoping that doesn't end up taking some ironic twist and that thing ends up being my fingers. Anyway, the only problem I think I could foresee is that I've now blocked the back. This isn't technically, I don't believe, a throatless shear, but I bet with thin stock, let me back up. Throatless shear means that there's effectively no throat at the back. There's nothing to stop a longer piece of sheet metal from being cut. Like you could put a full-size sheet metal in theory in a throatless version of these and just keep walking it through until you've cut through the whole thing. If that were possible here originally, it's not possible now because it would run into this support at the back. I don't think this shear could have done that anyway. Maybe for really thin stock, you could sort of bend out of the way, like really open it up as you're exiting out the back of the shear, but I'm not too worried about that. I've got other ways to cut big pieces of thin sheet metal. I also made this foot, for lack of a better name. Maybe it's a hold down, and I've got this block that takes a thread and fastener to hold this in place. We'll see this in action shortly, but first let me clear off some bench space and find a place to mount this thing. I've drilled and tapped my bench. Again, these are bench mount shears, and although it probably not strictly need be a bench, you do need to put them on something heavy and solid. I guess it depends on what you cut. Thin copper is probably a different story than eighth inch mild steel. But generally speaking, rock solid mounting makes for better times. Four rusty nails hammered over into an old log probably won't do it. 
unless that log still has roots and is still planted in the ground. I'm installed on the far end of my bench. This is where my benders live. I think I still have clearance for the Hossfeld clone, but I guess time will tell. I dug up some cutoffs. I've got 18 gauge aluminum, that's about a millimeter. Some 16 gauge steel, one and a half millimeters. And some 16 gauge stainless, again, about one and a half millimeters. The aluminum I'm hoping should be no problem at all. Nice, clean, straight cut. No burr to try the steel. Significantly more effort, but still good. 16 gauge stainless. A lot more force, as you'd expect, but still a very clean cut. No real burr to speak of. No blood. So I think that's it for the shear. I'm not exactly sure what capacity this thing is, but I don't know if I really want to push my luck. I'm sure I will in time though. Again, most of what I do is small. So for sheet metal, instead of sweating through hand shears, making a lot of racket with the angle grinder, this thing should be a lot faster and more convenient to, you know, square up little pieces, take them to size, that sort of stuff. What might be nice is a small little table here with a fence at the back to help keep the cuts square. I mean, for now I can work to scribe lines, but with a backstop square to the fixed blade, well, it'd be a dream squaring up small parts like this. One last thing I think I'm gonna do before I walk away, I'd like to cross drill this somewhere, maybe through the handle for a pin, something to lock out the shear. I've got kids with little fingers. So this is a universal vice. My apologies if I already said that, but feels like I'm dreaming. I'm not gonna tell you what I paid for this. Last thing I want is everyone unsubscribing. I was actually looking through piles of grinder parts, like grinder stuff and accessories. I was looking for some centers when this came out of nowhere. I assume it was used on a grinder. Don't know for sure, but that's likely where I'll use it. In fact, it's been quite some time I've been window shopping for a universal grinding vice. Looks just like one of these, except they usually have a clamping block on the top instead of a full-blown vise. They're all over eBay and Shars sells them for about a hundred bucks, I think. These are adjustable, as you might guess, in three axes. If it fits on my grinder, it should be a lot more convenient for grinding tooling, like lathe or shaper tooling or whatever. It's got the vise. I bet this thing could stand up to some light milling. All the connections feel like they move pretty good. The vise itself's a little bit gummed up. So same drill here. Gonna break it down, clean it up. The fits are absolutely spectacular. It's cast iron and it's got that 400 year old oil smell. I should probably be using a brass hammer. This thing's gotta be 200 years old at least. All right, that cleaned up pretty nice. I could have probably done a little bit more, but I'm happy with where it is. That was basically all engine cleaner, a wire brush, and some steel wool. The scales I did hit on the buffing wheel, they almost look chrome plated. And with all the dirty wax from the buffing wheel packed into the divisions, they're really nice to read, just crisp and easy to see. In this position, the vise stands at seven inches tall. That's almost 180 millimeters. And that's a nice size for my mill and my grinder. The jaws are four inches, 100 millimeter, and it opens to a smidge over two, or about 50. I think I might've measured two and a quarter so 60 millimeters maybe. Each axis is labeled to 90 degrees in two directions. I'll have to check, but I would imagine the zero degree reference would be the key in the bottom we saw earlier, potentially while I was taking this thing apart. So the key locks into the T-slots of the machine, at least on the mill, and that sets the zero reference. And then all the other angles would kind of build off of that. Without that key or a reference for those scales, those divisions would be close to useless. Like it's a step removed from say just a swivel vise where you could swing it to zero and sweep the fixed draw parallel to the machine. 
this, in contrast, has so many degrees of freedom, it, it would just be a lot harder to do, if not impossible. And in the same vein, setting one of these up can be a bit of a brain bender. I guess anytime you're setting up compound angles, it can get a little tricky. But where, say, a compound sine table isn't needed, like in 90% of what I do, this thing should be really convenient and a ton faster. I'm sure we'll be seeing this pop up a lot. All right, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching.